This is Tripwire Week in Review for week ending October 7th, 2022. I'm Martha Kocher with TREP, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS commercial real estate and CLO markets. I'm with Manis Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and Lonnie Henry, Head of Siri and Advisory Services. This week, President Biden looks for OPEC alternatives in response to the cartel's decision to slash oil production. And in economic data, September manufacturing grew at its slowest pace in more than two years, and factory orders were flat in August. And several data points on jobs, a big drop in job openings in August, and an uptick in this week's jobless claims to a five-week high. But interestingly, private sector jobs grew more than expected. Manus, after a big stock market bounce earlier this week, investors are watching for tomorrow's jobs report for some signs that the economy is responding to the Fed's medicine. Yeah, it's a funny position to be in. You almost get the sense that people are rooting for a dismal report so that there's more evidence that or the Fed will have more ammunition to take its foot off the accelerator when it comes to rate hikes. I think that remains to be seen. From my perspective, what I saw Monday and Tuesday, that really, really powerful rally, you know, this is just me talking off the top of my head, but it, it seemed like nothing more than a bear market bounce, right? It, it came even as treasury yields were rising, even as OPEC was scaling back production, as geopolitical events continue to weigh on the market. And I'm not just talking about the Ukraine, it's all the derivative issues in Germany and the UK, you know, what's going on there in terms of raging energy costs. Uh, we saw more companies talk about layoffs or pullbacks. And, you know, by and large, it felt like those two days were, as I started off with, a bear market uh, bounce. And today, of course, Thursday the 6th, we saw another reversal. Stocks fell again today. Interest rates continued to go up and more warnings. AMD came out shortly after the bell to say that its sales, you know, the big chip maker, uh, are going to be about 15 to 20% below what they were forecasting previously. I think that that's the beginning of a lot of what we'll see uh, over the next three or four weeks, people resetting earnings lower. Uh, we've been calling for it for a long time. I think the reset that we were expecting over the summer really wasn't as severe as we thought, but I think the combination of uh, rising costs, falling sales, and a slowing economy will conspire to make these next couple of weeks very volatile. We'll see. Yeah, I expect the same thing, man. It's waiting for the, the jobs report tomorrow. There's a couple of other, you know, noteworthy nuggets here. Um, Institute for Supply Management Manufacturing Survey, say that five times fast, uh, declined from 52.8% in August. Uh, fell to a 28-month low uh, in September, 50.9%. So we have a couple of quotes uh, here from the survey. The uh, Timothy Fiore, chairman of the survey, says, companies are saying we don't need as many employees. So I think um, we're starting to see a little bit of a shift there. He further says, that's a clear change compared to where we've been a year or a year and a half ago. Um, a couple of other just you know macro things. Construction spending was down 0.7% in August. Uh, Wall Street's estimate was for it to drop two tenths of a percent. You know, you hit on the job market cooling. Uh, August was a 13 month low, 10.1 million uh, openings. And then a couple of other housing footnotes here. Benchmark treasury yields eased a little bit. Mortgage rates flipped this week to 6.66%. A little bit nervous even saying that number, but um, it's, it's better news than 7.2 or whatever we were last week. And then some reports of the rapid pace that uh, you know rate hikes have taken and how that's impacted residential inventory. So I think Bloomberg had a report this week that said the the months of supply, which is you know a general measure for like equilibrium, probably six to seven months worth of housing inventory available for sale. It's been at historic lows for some time. January this year was two point one months of inventory. Uh, on a national basis, and it has recently jumped up to 4.1. So while we're still not quite at equilibrium from a pricing perspective, you know, we're basically doubled up where we were just a few months ago. So uh, it'll be very interesting to see how that shock is absorbed in the market. And I think we're starting to see a lot of properties sit on the market for longer, prices starting to come down, 
you know, some very interesting things, lots of uh, news around layoffs and a few other things that we'll get into here in a moment. But I agree. I think the next couple of weeks are going to be a little topsy-turvy. Yeah, one thing I watched on Bloomberg today, which I, I thought was interesting, I don't watch the European residential markets a whole lot. Uh, I'm, I'm very much a tourist in that space, maybe even not even a tourist. Uh, you know, data catches my eye periodically, but I'm not an expert by any by any means. But they said on Bloomberg this morning that the vast majority of UK residential loans are floating rate. And that will be a killer when you add that on top of surging energy costs, right? Here in the US, to put it in perspective, a year ago, the 30-year fixed rate mortgage, I think, was under three. I think it was like 295 or 299, uh, according to Freddie Mac, if I remember correctly. And you have to figure that the vast majority of people financed or refinanced at that level. So what you're seeing for homeowners right now is more of a wealth effect, right? That these higher rates are removing supply of would-be buyers, forcing prices to come down. And at some point, a buyer can only spend so much of their income to buy a house, right? Either that's gonna be made up of interest payments or it's gonna be made up of principal payments because you paid a lot of money um, for the house, right? There should be some equilibrium there over time. And to Lonnie's point, prices have started to cool off a little bit. But in the UK, there isn't that equilibrium, right? You haven't locked in a two-handle two mortgage rate if you're in a floating rate situation. and you know, I thought things were bad in Europe before this. And once I heard this this morning, you know, from the, the trio that runs that kind of 7 a.m. till 9.30 segment, you know, that kind of blew my mind. Because if, if you're floating rate and you're, you know, paying two or three times what you were for energy, that's a crusher. Yeah, I think the on the residential side, it's felt even more, like you said, because most people have a fixed budget for for housing costs and they can't pass that on. If your mortgage interest rate goes up on the commercial side, you may be able to increase your rents. You probably can offset some of those additional costs that you're incurring. But if you're, you know, living there, your uh your pay isn't necessarily going up and those costs can be can be pretty damning. So um I did see a meme this morning. I know we got transition here, but it was saying the new dating profiles, you know, you list your job, your salary, how new your car is. And if you've locked in a 2.75% interest rate for 30 years, you make sure you include that on the uh, on the profile. <laughs> There we go. So before we move on to other things, I wanted to throw this one by you. Um, we haven't talked about this before. The information just came out today, so it's a little bit of a curveball. But this comes from Diana Olick of CNBC. She's been covering the residential business for CNBC for a long time. And she referred to a piece. You can find it on their website. The whole segment is recorded. Here are some headlines from this piece. Uh, the data is from RealPage. It said, for the first time, in 30 years of tracking this metric that uh, apartment rental demand fell in Q3 2022, first time in 30 years. Asking rents growing at a slower pace than at any time in the last two years. And then there was one other piece of data in here. I'm gonna look for it. It talked about the number of units that are expected to come online in the next year. And I think it was 915,000 new units coming on. So I'm throwing a lot at you, Martha and Lonnie. You know, give me your thoughts about that. Does this kind of fit what you're seeing? And, and how bad will it be for the multifamily property owner? Well, I think it's something we talked a little bit about last week on the pod, and we talked about those upcoming maturities and some of the cracks starting to show. There's a lot more multifamily stuff with debt service less than 125 than people realize. I think this is a function of just affordability. Property owners on the multifamily side have been able to increase rents pretty much at will. And now that interest rates are as high as they are, by definition, a lot of people can't qualify for homes. And so that increases the, the you know the ability for property owners to uh, increase rental rates for their tenants. And I think what we're seeing is a spillover. You look at uh, RV parks, mobile home parks, et cetera. I think the demand curve is significant there because people are being priced out of multifamily. So we'll see, as far as the new construction, we've had about 10 years worth of, you know, sizable construction across major metros in the U.S. And 
It hasn't put a dent in occupancy and it hasn't put a dent in rental rates until maybe just now. So it'll be very interesting to see. I think CRE Direct had an article about a month ago, and I don't remember the stats specifically, but I think there's new, there's more new building permits issued for multifamily in the last like 18 months than there had been since the early 80s. Um, so I think we're we're maybe converging on significant increase in supply, downward pressure uh, from an affordability perspective, and maybe some alternative options that people are trying to find. The other thing to, to look at, Manus too, and I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, but the build to rent, you know, that may be putting a dent finally in some of the multifamily stuff where some of these would-be renters of an apartment are now moving into a single family home. I was going to add that that the data is consistent with other data that we've talked about on the pod. In fact, I think there was a story in the Wall Street Journal probably in the last week that quoted several data points talking about rents declining. They were quoting data from August, so obviously that's a little farther back. But you know, just looking at the transactions that are uh, being reported on a regular basis, it's industrial and multifamily. So there is just a, a steady stream, even as other property sectors are a little quieter, of activity around this space, and it has to take uh, an impact point. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, you're absolutely right. We, we've mentioned this in the past, that we're not looking at a clogged artery when it comes to sales of properties, even unloved properties like hotels and retail are still getting done here and there. Uh, but multifamily continues to march on. Every every week, there's a dozen, two dozen uh, new things getting announced. Cap rates seem to be moving up, but not at a very steep pace. I think it's a very steady pace. So the market is functioning, and that's a big difference than what we saw in 2008 or 2010. So that's, you know, a, a silver lining for sure. And if it continues that way, you know, these headwinds hopefully become nothing more than a, a flesh wound. So while you guys were uh, were talking about those extra points, I ran through uh, some of our dashboards and pulled up a few additional data elements from the TREP data set. So for multifamily specifically, I just ran a quick search for multifamily properties in the data set. This would include traditional CMBS, Fannie Freddie, and CRE CLO. Uh, and surprisingly, if you run a search nationwide for multifamily assets that have loan to value, current loan to value at 90% or greater, there's just over $8 billion worth of multifamily with LTV at 90% or greater. So if you couple, if anything that Mana says comes to fruition, you're going to see a lot of things start to slip through the cracks. I mean, that number is pretty surprising to me, having just looked at it, because it, it, we've had the feeling and appearance that multifamily has kind of been indestructible, kind of along the same lines as industrial over the last couple of years. But that's a pretty sizable amount of uh, multifamily properties. Now, some of those on the CLO you would expect to be a little higher leverage, but 90% is pretty significant on the LTV side. Yeah, my predictions rarely come to fruition. So we'll see. Maybe this will be the, uh, the outlier. So let's move to the delinquency report that we just published for this week. And again, it looks like it's fallen. When we had teased this two weeks ago, we said that our first read of September data had been that there was nothing really alarming in there. Uh, at that point, we probably had about 75 or 80% of the, the loans reporting, uh, and we didn't see any you know, train wrecks uh, in the data. When the data was completed uh, and the report was put out, you know, it was consistent with, with what we said, and that is you know, the CMBS stabilized loan market in terms of its performance remains incredibly resilient at this point. The overall delinquency rate in September, 2.92%, down another six basis points from uh, August. Uh, for those that have listened for a long time, you know that the, the rate peaked in the COVID period uh, north of 10%. Year over year, the delinquency rate is down 233 basis points year to date down 165 basis points. The rate is now down in 25 of the last 27 um, months. The percentage of loans that are seriously delinquent, meaning 60 days or more in foreclosure, REO, that was down 11 basis points, 2.78%. Uh, one year ago, the delinquency rate was 5.25%. So a lot of good news there, really kind of incredibly resilient. You know, this, the, the narrative there is things that were really damaged 
during COVID, hotel and retail continue to approve. And those things that we, are, we worry about uh, extensively, meaning the BNC class offices, that's gonna have a really long tail. And we're not seeing a whole lot of uptick in that yet. That's gonna come when these loans start to mature or they lose tenants of significant size, uh, at least expiration. Running through the property types uh, very quickly, industrial, just a, a rock star, it's delinquency rate under 50 basis points, you know, virtually no delinquencies in the industrial space. Lodging, uh, just over 5%, that peaked at 25% early in COVID. Multifamily, under 1%, uh, like Lonnie said, indestructible to date, only 93 basis points of delinquency. Offices moved up slightly, eight basis points, but still only 1.58%. Retail remains the laggard, 6.61%, and that's driven mostly by B and C class malls that back loans that were made between 2012 and 2015. That's what really drives that number higher. So, but a lot of good news in there. And, um, you know, as, as we go through the rest of the pod, you'll see that there's both good news and bad news to tap into this week. Yeah, the delinquency stuff is good news in the sense that, you know, even when COVID was kind of waning, we were worried about the shadow delinquency because a lot of these assets got brought current using reserves and we we're afraid maybe they're going to come back on uh, the report, but they just haven't. And so I agree with you, Manus. I think the maturities are what you need to be paying attention to because that's where we're going to get an idea of what's happening in the market. Are the lenders going to, you know, take these assets and do something with them? Are they going to extend and pretend, kick the can? What's the, what's the outcome going to be? Um, but it's really great. We want to see low delinquency it means the market's working. So it's good to see. Okay. You know, I, I stick with the prediction I made maybe three or four months ago, which is, you know, offices to the extent that they run into trouble will go down that same extend and pretend path. I think that using the last five years of BNC class malls as a proxy, if you're choosing to lay, lay your bets on CMBX long or short or CMBS uh, credit. You know, I, I think that's the way it goes. Certainly, like we saw with 1740 Broadway in Manhattan, when L Brands lease was up, we saw the owner there look to give the property back very quickly. But even that process takes a long time to, to play out. So I, I think that that's the proxy you want to use when you're kind of predicting losses and resolution time periods and so forth. And so good news on the delinquency front. Uh, turning to issuance, we've seen a slowdown in what's happening in the last uh, third quarter. So we're going to go over some of the numbers that we have there. Yeah, so we actually had a story in the CRE Direct uh, publication that kind of looked through this. I'm going to just read off of uh, the table of, of what we put out. But, you know, Private label issuance slowed pretty significantly in the third quarter. I mean, I think this is due largely to market volatility, higher interest rates, you know, pretty much stifled the lending volume. 16 deals, 13 billion price during the quarter, which was down 35% from the second quarter, uh, where 20.56 billion was priced. It's 39% less than the 21.68 billion from a year ago. So pretty sizable decline in total issuance for the third quarter. The year so far is about 62.8 billion, which is uh, seven, just over 7% less than what we were last year. So I think it's it's interesting to point out, we actually started off 22 ahead of the 21 pace in terms of issuance. So it wasn't until recently that we started to see a pretty significant decline. And I think it makes sense. I mean, the first six months of the year, um, even though we had the Russia, Ukraine and a few other you know, macro events happening, interest rates had been fairly low, the markets were still performing fairly well. So if you look at this by uh, type, you know, conduit um, on a relative basis in 21, had 22 deals in 22 through nine months, we're at, at 20 deals, uh, 72 on the single borrower, so SASB deals in 21 uh, through nine months were 72 deals, about 44 billion in issuance. And then we're at 50 deals in 22, but surprisingly, the issuance number on the SASB deals are actually pretty close, just over $42 billion. So all in all, if you if you look at conduit, single borrower, other, and CLO, 133 deals through nine months last year, total issuance of $100 billion, basically at 99 deals and $90 billion through the first nine months of 22. So, you know, the silver lining with that, we're always looking for silver linings, 
for those that didn't live through the great financial crisis, we went 21 months without a single deal being issued. So even though issuance is decelerating, uh, according to Lonnie's numbers, and, and it feels like it's decelerating, and it may continue to decelerate, uh, again, deals are happening and we're still seeing financings get done. So, you know, that's the silver lining compared to how bad it can be, as we've seen in the past. Okay, so Lonnie gave us some insights into some property sector data that he was pulling from our TREP Insights. And this segment is calling Digging Through the Data. Haley, cue the bulldozer sound. Well, I'm a little bit sad after that introduction, Martha. I was really hoping that you were going to do the demo sound. Uh, you wanted but I to guess... like do the, which is uh, <laughs> my very bad bulldozer sound. That's pretty awesome. When my kids were little, they had this, uh, they had some trash trucks. They were like pretend trash trucks and they had the arm that picked up the trash can and like dumped it in the top, you know, and they wanted to watch the trash man come by every day. So yeah, maybe I should bring a trash truck and we can use that. So yeah, thanks for the uh, for the intro on this. We had some really good feedback from a couple of these uh, data nuggets that we threw out last week on the pod. And so we thought we would do something similar going forward. And so we just talked a little bit about, you know, the multifamily space and having high leverage in some of those properties. And so I quickly pulled up some of the other property types to look at what that looks like across their spectrum. So uh, multifamily was significant, as we mentioned just a moment ago, it was over uh, 8 billion worth of multifamily loan value that's 90% uh, LTV or higher, but retail was first, uh, which is worst, um, because it's uh, 11.6 billion worth of retail properties have loan to value at 90% or greater across the spectrum. Um, so pretty significant. If you look at all of the property types, there's about 38 billion worth of properties in our data set right now that have loan to value at 90% or more. So by property count, lodging has the most, um, but by by loan balance, it's retail. And I think to Manis's point, a lot of that is those older BNC malls on the retail side that are just underwater and they've been underwater and there's really nothing to do with them at this point. So they're kind of just sitting out there. But lodging was significant, almost 10 billion, multifamily at eight. Uh, office was coming in at just about 5.1 billion. So pretty sizable numbers when you look at, you know, properties that aren't showing up in delinquency, aren't showing up necessarily as, as distress from any of our definitions. Um, but you never want to be in a position where your loan to value is 90% plus. And a lot of these are over a hundred. Going on to property sectors, we're going to start with office and we owe some props to our own Haley Keene. Yeah, I was sitting around on, uh, I guess it was Monday night, watching the Rams and the Niners. This made its way into our trading alert. And I got a text from Haley, who I thought was a bigger football fan. I thought she would have been riveted to that, that miserable game as well. But she told me about something that was buzzing on Twitter Monday night, and that was the termination of a big lease by Facebook at 225 Park Avenue South, which had Twitter a buzz on Monday night. And we put out a trading alert that night to talk about the ramifications of that. We'll run through that. It's part of a theme that we're going to talk about today, which is big companies announcing big givebacks of space. So in this particular case, Facebook terminated its lease at 225 Park Avenue South. Um, the amount of money that's involved here is kind of staggering. They put $100 million into this, into uh, preparing the space to move into, into lease payments thus far and to a sizable now termination fee that they're going to have to, um, they're going to have to, to get out of this. So we, we didn't confirm this on Monday night, but it was confirmed early Tuesday. And, and now this is, this is truth. The property is a 675,000 square foot office. Facebook has 40% uh, of the space. It paid about 45% of the base rate at the time a 2017 loan was made. Uh, Facebook's lease is supposed to run until 2027, but it does have a termination option uh, in March, 2024. Uh, that option required 18 months notice. So you work back 18 months from March, 2024, when you get to September, 2022, and we find out now why Facebook terminated now. The termination fee is about 18 months worth of lease payments. The property itself 
backs $430 million in debt, a $235 million senior loan, a nearly $200 million MES piece. Um, though that loan is split among, the senior loan is split among four 2017 deals, uh, including about 160 million that backs CMBX 11. So that's the negative part of the story. The positive part of the story comes from, and I think we're the only one that caught this, the New York Business Journal was reporting that Monday.com has taken about 110,000 square feet of space at that property. Since the property is already 99% occupied, uh, it goes to figure that Monday.com has taken some of the space from Facebook. Hopefully that's the case. So a lot going on with this loan, but I, I think that the, the headline is, here is Meta, Facebook, huge absorber of space for the last 10 years, now tapping the brakes and going in the other direction. What do you think, Lonnie? Well, I think we talked about this during the pandemic when a lot of these firms signed very large leases across the country and we weren't real sure what their strategy was. I mean, at that point, everyone was fully remote and they were signing really large leases on a long-term basis. And to your point, putting a lot of money up front into those deals. Um, and I think we're just starting to see it play out in real time. Like they don't need the space. It's a, obviously a significant headline because it's meta. But in the relative scheme of New York office, like does this one tenant downsizing or vacating the lease with a bunch of you know termination penalties, like is that a, a significant negative for the office market? I mean, yeah, she'd rather have them in there paying, but there's there's so much space. You know, I think we're going to see more of this. I don't know that there's a huge shift in the office market just because a few of the tech firms decide they're going to downsize. Um, but I think we're starting to get a little more clarity. Like they they were betting on back to the office work, you know, coming back and locking those leases in during favorable terms in 2020 or maybe 2018, 2019 leading up. And this hasn't happened. So I think we'll see more of it. I, I wouldn't be surprised if you see some of the other large tech companies doing the same thing. Well, you asked for more, Lonnie, you're going to get more. We got uh, a couple of other pieces on this too. I said, I promised to kind of put this into a theme and bucket these things. Here we go. So this next story comes from uh, Alex Halverson, the Puget Sound Business Journal. Uh, Microsoft said this week that it will be vacating more of its big office space in Seattle and Bellevue than previously expected. Uh, originally, um, it was known that it was going to give up building C and D uh, in 90 East Sammamish Park. Now they're saying that they're also going to give up space in the Advana Office Commons building, uh, Lincoln Square North as well, when those leases end in 2023. It doesn't appear that they're giving up the entirety of those latter two buildings. But again, just as with Facebook, an inflection point, right? Formerly, Microsoft taking big slugs of space in Virginia and Atlanta. Right now, here they're tapping the brakes. In Minneapolis, this is from Mark Riley of the Minneapolis St. Paul Business Journal, Prime Therapeutics which in 2019, only three years ago, opened up a 400,000 square foot corporate campus in Egan, has now put the entirety of that space up for sublet. You know, hard to imagine something turning that quickly. Why did this catch our attention? Well, certainly the size had a lot to do with it. 400,000 square feet in uh, Egan, Minneapolis, in Minnesota is gonna be uh, big by any measure, but it comes on the heels of something we told you about maybe three weeks ago where Optum, another health services uh, organization, put 630,000 square feet of sublet space on the market. And previous to that, Target had put some space on the market, 800,000 square feet in Minneapolis. So uh, a lot of excess space there. And lastly, in Palo Alto, SAP, uh, SAP, uh, announced that they would not be renewing their building. Um, there, it's a fairly small building, but they're the only tenant. Uh, a 56,000 square foot office. They were the sole tenant on a lease that was ending this summer and they have decided not to renew. So there's our theme, if you will. A lot of firms deciding to uh, tap the brakes, give back space, look to sublet, and there'll be others. I think the Minneapolis stuff is interesting. I mean, that's about 2 million square feet of space that hits the market. I mean, at that point, we asked a little bit 
of our listeners last week, when do you hit that critical mass for things becoming a sublease market? And I, I would have to assume there with those really large footprints coming online, that's probably by definition the sublease market at this point. We don't limit ourselves just to crabgrass. We are glass half full people. So we do have a lot of green shoots here that we'll run through. In New York City, the New York City School Construction Authority uh, has taken 350,000 square feet at one quart square. Uh, that building is owned by Savannah. If that rings a bell for you, that particular address, it's because at one time, uh, Amazon was circling that building, had signed a lease saying that they were going to make that their HQ2. Uh, politicians in New York and community leaders stiffened their backs. Amazon pulled out of it. And for a while, we thought one court street could be on the ropes. Uh, it did back a big CMBS loan at one point, but they brought in a big pharma company. I think it might have been Centene that took over space there. And now they've added another 350,000 square feet from this New York City authority. In Chicago, where there's never recently been a lot of good news, we got some good news there. Zeris Biopharma signed a 13-year lease for almost 90,000 square feet at 1375 West Fulton. That story comes from Danny Ecker of Crane's Chicago Business. And by the way, the previous story was from Mark Hollum of the Commercial Observer. In New York, uh, this is the New York suburb of uh, White Plains, a 320,000 square foot office on Maranek Avenue in White Plains has been sold, no price given there. In Sacramento, 925 L Street has been sold for price, which is 16% above its 2016 value. Fairly high cap rate, 7.28%. It's, it's a government-occupied building. But in Sacramento, where there's a decent amount of space there, and this is an aging building, Class B, with a government tenant, any deal is a good deal, right? And at 16% above the 2016 value, we will take it. One more green shoot. Yeah, so this one comes from the uh, Boston Business Journal, uh, credit to Greg Ryan. Eaton Vance signed a lease, 282,000 square foot. Uh, this is in one of the old post office uh, towers. It's been transformed in the Boston uh, Financial District. This has been something that's been in the works for about a year. And so finally, it's uh, been, been executed. Uh, some of the footnotes here, the investment firm is going to take uh, the space in 14th through the 21st floors. Third, really large office deal in the greater Boston area since the pandemic, you know, trails only Amazon and Inner Systems Corp. It says a deal was signed by Morgan Stanley, which acquired Eaton Vance in March of 21. So good news there. Um, you know, we're calling that greenish. You know, the, the offset of this is that uh, they're going to be leaving their headquarters at uh, International Place, which it's been leasing about 340,000 square feet. So you know, when these transitions or relocations happen, it's great for the new building, it's great for the new lease, but it usually leaves a little bit of a hole um, where that tenant is vacating. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, when you talk about things like that in Boston, it's kind of having sympathy for the Yankees or the, you know, the Golden State Warriors, right? You know, they, they win titles so often that, you well, the Yankees haven't won in a while, but they did for a long time, you know. It's kind of like the world's smallest violin that you're playing there for Boston, right? It's been such a, a tremendously successful market, especially with that life science stuff. And they still have a, a terrific financial services footprint as well. It's hard to get too, uh, too teary-eyed about somebody in Boston downsizing by 60,000 square feet. Not to mention, by the way, the, uh, you know, the Patriots and the Red Sox for the last 15 years. I think their cups runneth over Yes. Well, let's move on to retail. And I saw a story that says that holiday sales are coming even earlier. So all of you that love when they put out the holiday decorations right after Halloween's over, guess what? Starting earlier and apparently it works. People that are pressed to uh, fill out their holiday shopping lists will spread it out over a longer period of time, make it easier on them. And, and the uh, retailers are aware of that. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a, it's a great thing if you're not part of our fan club already, you know, we do a giveaway every year for a fan club. And this year, you know, if you've ever seen Elf on a Shelf, this year we're doing Lonnie on a ledge, right? Nice. You could hide him all over the, uh, the house. You know, if you tickle him under the chin, he'll talk about ground leases. If you pull his finger, 
He talks about, you know, lease expiration dates and debt service coverage ratio. Comes with a full wardrobe. You know, there's a taupe one that fits in with your living room, camouflage for the kids' room. and He's got to have sneakers egg, and caps, too. Eggshell yeah. for the bathroom. You can hide them all over the house. So if you want one of these things, you know, it, it's it's not something you want to do without. Lonnie on a ledge, or is it maybe it. Lonnie on the landing? I don't know, which is better. Uh, well, I think hey, the ledge. As, as cool as that sounds, you better get your name in the hat now. You want to sign up now. That thing's going to be flying off the shelf, literally. Be hot. Right. To, or maybe we should have done Tickle Me, Tickle Me Lonnie. I don't know. <laughs> that, would have been... that could be bad. So we did have one nice story here. Uh, there wasn't a lot of retail activity. A lot of the stuff that we saw was kind of on the smaller side, 15 to $20 million sales. We have seen, you know, some smaller stuff done. The biggest one we saw this time was uh, a retail center in Los Angeles known as Koreatown. The story comes from Bianca Baragian, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, from BizNow. The buyer was INI Investment Corp. The seller was a Los Angeles-based Korean shopping center uh, developer. The property has 140,000 square feet of enclosed space built in 1988 and sold for $91 million which equated to about $450 per square foot, which is a, a decent price tag. In a market that hasn't been great, um, you know, certainly Grocery Anchored has been great, but, um, you know, the California market has struggled at times. So um, bully for the owners of that getting a, a really nice price for that. So we had a we had a story in the Dallas Morning News this week. Uh, Maria Halkius, uh, Nordstrom is shrinking its footprint in the, uh, the Galleria Dallas. Uh, so they're currently occupying three levels at the mall, and they're going to take that down to two levels. So it's a 225,000-square-foot store. It was Nordstrom's first store in Texas. It opened in 1996, um, and they said they're going to basically give the, you know 47,000 or so square foot of the space. Uh, they're going to have that vacated before Thanksgiving. So currently in the, in the layout, that's where they have their kids, baby gear, home, activewear, uh, women's plus sizes and marketplace cafe and they're going to be moved and consolidated into their other two floors on one and two and a new food concept is going to be going in on the second floor so it'll be interesting to see what happens with that space i mean multi-story retail is a challenge anyways these big boxes for some time seem to have it figured out but you know i guess the good news here is that they're not vacating it's not going to go dark but they're going to have a pretty large footprint upstairs that's not going to be utilized and so it'll be interesting to see potentially if they maybe transition some of that into some last mile distribution which would be difficult on the third floor uh, but they must have some sort of plan or some sort of strategy as to being more efficient on floors one and two or better than having three inefficient floors so um, I think they referenced a couple of stats in the article that 42 uh, percent of Nordstrom's uh, 14 billion in overall sales were from online purchases. So I think that just speaks to the narrative of less people in the store, no need for a third floor. So maybe they'll open a haunted house or one of those Halloween stores um, up on the third floor. So let me throw you a curveball, Lonnie. You know, I, I didn't mention this earlier, but you know, a couple of days ago, Costco came out with their earnings, uh, nice and strong, sales up very impressively, uh, 10%. You know, the takeaway from me you know, the logical thinking is they're taking foot traffic away from grocery anchored and other traditional places that may be uh, more expensive, right? What's your takeaway there? Is, is this going to come at the expense of Walmart and Target, which will also now sell food? Is it going to come at the expense of, you know, uh, a Trader Joe's or a higher end grocery store? Or is it going to be evenly distributed across everybody? Yeah, so quickly, I'm going to have to start taking some batting practice for all these curveballs because because uh, I might be swinging and missing. I'm not sure today, but I'll get in the cage. I'll get some blisters back on the hands like the good old days and uh, next week it's gonna be, be better prepared. Balls. <laughs> it's be knuckle balls next week, so you better be yeah. uh, on your game. <laughs> yeah, so if you if you see me coming in with some uh, some calloused hands next week, you know it's I've uh, been in the cage. Yeah, I think it's interesting. You know, Costco is has, you know, I think the tougher economic times, um, they do better because people want to buy in bulk and get that economy of scale. And so you've seen some increased activity there. You know, they've really diversified the store, electronics, you know, satellite TV, cell phones, groceries, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Bloomberg today, they were talking about 
you know, the large retailers like Walmart have seen a, a nice uptick as well. So people having to go to the lower price option. So, you know, I think Costco fits in that realm in terms of the bulk buying. So it'll be interesting to see if that's evenly distributed. I think Trader Joe's is kind of in a class of its own. I've never seen a Trader Joe's in the U.S. and any city that I've been to that, you know, one, if it's not in an urban location and they actually have a parking lot that's not overfilled with cars, and two, if it's in a downtown urban location that, you know, there's usually people on the escalators or whatever to get up to it, it's been, uh, they've kind of just created their own little niche that I don't think will be impacted by by Costco or anyone else. But for some of these other grocery anchors, traditional grocery anchors, they're probably going to feel the pressure. They benefited during the pandemic, but historically, those have been very low margin businesses. Um, and without demand or when de demand wanes, they can become, you know, pretty tight. We've seen a lot of consolidations over the years of grocery uh, anchors, you know. So um, I think it's something to keep an eye on. Uh, and it'll be interesting. Uh, grocery anchor retail for the last two or three years has been kind of the darling of the large retail. And those days may be numbered if uh, you continue to see Sam's Club, Costco, and these others do so well. Do you think there's appetite for bulk Lonnie on the landing? So like if we had a 12 pack, do you think that people would be uh, clamoring for those at, you know, maybe, you know, 28% off? That might, well, freak, that might freak the kids out, you know, <laughs> hey, what it, are you already freaks, <laughs> it already freaks them out when the elf on a shelf moves, you know, from one day to the next, you have multiple Lonnie's on a landing or ledge. That could be weird. I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, I'm a little biased, but I think it'd be pretty cool. I'm hoping Haley, like by then the podcast, <laughs> Haley has a, a distribution deal. She's got merchandise up, so, ready to go. Yeah, she's got the merch. All right. So our last story is the Q3 bank earnings, which uh, we used our TREP capital adequacy stress test, which is not easy to say. That's why TCAST is easier to say, to forecast the results this quarter. And just like last time where Matt Anderson produced some predictions and forecasting, we're going to grade how we did when those numbers actually come out mid-month of October. So what do the stats show so far? So just a, a step back, our capital adequacy stress testing is a module that we built years ago coming out of the great financial crisis. It uses, uh, I think, between 10 and 15 different variables like GDP and unemployment, uh, interest rates, and so forth to predict bank performance. Uh, it was built to help banks meet the CCAR and Dodd-Frank mandates for stress testing, but we've since pivoted. Uh, to have an alternative use, which is forecasting earnings. In Q2, Matt did very well. He had uh, pretty much nailed this stuff uh, in terms of direction and magnitude of what the earnings would be. Um, hopefully, he could pull off the same again. Uh, the tool itself is quite interesting, and, and for people that uh, are interested in bank earnings, we, you know, we'd love to show it to you. But he's predicting this time the results won't be as bad as some of the financial analysts are are thinking. He's a little bit more upbeat than some in the uh, prediction space on Wall Street. And let's hope he's right. You know, it is tough sledding for banks right now. Loan demand is lower. The yield curve is very, very flat. Banks make more money when the yield curve is steep. Uh, right now, the two-year is, is two treasury is above the 10-year treasury. People are talking about having more credit issues down the line. So uh, the headwinds are there, but Mac, Matt is saying we're going to outperform the uh, the consensus. We'll see. Let's hope so. Yes, it looks like uh, it's predicting slight increase in revenues for the largest banks, about two tenths of a percent versus uh, Q3 of 21, and then higher interest rates have boost interest income. So predicting a year over year increase of about 15 percent in Q3, as compared to an increase of 18 percent in Q2. So. Uh, as Martha and Manis have laid out, we'll uh, we'll check how we did here in a couple of weeks. And if you want that full report, give us a shout. We'll send you uh, a link to that, and you can you can grade us as well. So let us know how we did. A programming note: we have a live panel discussion where Altus is hosting that, and our own Lonnie Henry is going to be on the panel. They're going to have a bunch of ex experts from principal real estate, as well as our own TREP representative, Lonnie. They're going to talk about U.S. debt in focus. That's October 13th. And if you want the details of that particular panel, 
send us an email and we'll give you how to get uh, included in the login there. Yeah, I think this is supposed to be a very popular thing. I think they have several hundred people lined up for this thing already. So looking forward to listening to it. And turning to shout outs, we have a bunch. So let's get through them quickly. Brad S. He said, uh, while Ani at TREP has access to more transparent commercial mortgage market securitized information, just imagine the conversation in bank loan committees right now. Great coverage and analysis worth reading. That was on LinkedIn. Scott B. shared our weekly blog, The Market Pulse. And if you aren't getting The Market Pulse, you should uh, give us a shout about that. We'll send that to you. It's uh, actually something that was created by our own Stephen Bushbaum, and it goes out weekly about what's happening in the market and how that relates to commercial real estate and CMBS. Richard E. loved the CRE exposure piece about Florida and uh, acknowledged that it's just horrible to see the damage. A lot of Twitter engagement. Rohan J. actually kicked off a thread that had to do with Lonnie's quoting of data last week of the $52 billion worth of loans that are maturing. And Zach Q. Uh, jumped on that thread. Snowball Capital Partners shared our latest episode. Andy P. loved the podcast. And our own Oz reached out for more color on the 17 billion of loans with occupancies less than 80%. So we gave him some information about that. Jose A reached out for hurricane exposure information and life comps. Brock S was interested in our brand ambassador program. And if you had heard about that, it's for students that are sophomores or juniors and are interested in commercial real estate and finance and would like to do some type of internship work. So let us know if you are interested in that. Peter G has their group actually listen to our pod. If you can imagine, I, I'm guessing these people sit around a table and either collectively listen to it. I mean, I don't know, maybe we just go to Cleveland and do this for them. Well, I'm, I'm, always up, for that. For good, I'm up for a road trip at any, at any point. So that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, let us know. And Philly Mike loves the pod and the cast, which is very clever. And appreciated the comparison of today's hedging risk to 2008. And then had a question about that and was interested in our take. So we'll have to uh, take that up, I think, on a follow-up pod. Speaking of Philly, Key Lime Johnny, you know who you are. Over the last 100 years, he says, the surest sign of an economic downturn has been a Philly-based baseball team winning the World Series. It happened in 1929, 30, 80, and 2008. And on Monday night, the Phils clinched the playoff spot for the upcoming postseason. Now, he is a fan of the Phillies, lest you think he isn't. It's, you know, I can't believe we're 50 minutes into this podcast. And I haven't mentioned the fact that the Mets are in the playoffs again. The Giants have a winning record as of the first week in October. I think it's the first time in seven years. Hockey season is coming. Clemson is undefeated. It is just... You know, it's nirvana in the Clancy family right now. We're all very, very uh, happy. And if the Mets can take down the Padres, we'll be even happier. How could you not mention the Yankees star that finally hit the 62nd home run that everybody was waiting for? Come on. Well, I should have brought that up. Aaron Judge does seem like, I'm not a Yankee fan, but Judge seems like a really good guy. And uh, kudos to him for, for doing that. You know, I have to say I was tremendously distracted by the whole thing because I was really going through that crowd looking for Lonnie thinking maybe he was going to be out there with his mitt maybe he'd be the guy catching that ball you know racing down to the uh, the auction house maybe we wouldn't even see him today right he would have you know paid off his mortgage and taken his family to the Caymans and that would have been it I don't know but uh, Lonnie disappointed me he wasn't out there uh, you know with that big fishing net that he brings to the ball game yeah, I was uh, I was actually in the batting cage getting ready for these curveballs, but uh, <laughs> I looked at tickets. Uh, and they're like seven hundred bucks for some cheap seats, and I was like, I can't afford all that. And then, you know, but listen, even if I caught the ball, the guy has already been offered two million bucks for it. If someone gave me two million bucks, I'm still showing up for work on Monday. Like that's just the way it is. I'm gonna I be here for the be pod. next to Lottie, you know, in the bleachers out there. He's like a Wolverine out there. You know, he'd be out there. <laughs> trying to tear my lungs out to get that ball. You know, it's just taking my life in my hands. And with that, 
We'll close. Thanks to our producer, Haley Keene, who's combing Twitter for the next big story. Join us next week as we look at what's happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question, a comment, send your email to podcast at trep.com and subscribe to the podcast with your favorite provider. Thank you for listening and stay well. Let's go Mets.